Um, I think that's a miserable assumption. Uh, they, they, they have a DF, a decontamination factor, of 100. So that means 1 in 100 gets out and 99% remains behind. Uh, it's a poor assumption, and uh, um, but it, it, it serves TEPCO's needs. You know, they really want to minimize this accident, and, and a 30 with 15 zeros is as small as they can they can get the number apparently goodness me you know when i think as a physician you know and a patient in the icu with with profound septicemia and blood poisoning uh, you could minimize it but the truth is um <laughs> the patient may be absolutely swarming with lethal bacteria and despite how much antibiotic you give them they're going to die so it doesn't matter if you minimize it or not the reality is that you probably lose the patient because you're not dealing with accurate data right you're absolutely right yeah and um, uh, unfortunately both the Japanese government and Tokyo Electric have the same motive and that motive is to minimize the radiological consequences of this uh, of this accident and uh, you know TEPCO just yesterday offered uh, 80,000 yen for every person within 30 miles of the plant. That's $1,000. That was their, their settlement number. Oh, that's number. big of them. <laughs> so we've destroyed your, your entire state, the, the, the prefecture of, of uh, Fukushima, Fukushima. And, um, uh, and for your troubles, we'll give you $1,000. Yeah, uh, uh, th- so they want to minimize the health risk and minimize the radiation risk to minimize the amount of money they have to pay to the victim. Well, let's go back to the ocean uh, contamination, Arnie Gunderson. Um, and, and almost certainly the 30 peta becquerels is an underestimate, as you said, and a becquerel continues to disintegrate each second, so it's 30 tetra becquerels each second for, I don't know, decades or more. Now... Talk about what that means to the seaweed, which the Japanese love, and the fish, and talk about the fish swimming thousands of miles. Talk about the fact that the EPA is not testing the fish that are being caught on the west coast of Canada and the United States. Can you address that issue, please? Uh, yeah, we're seeing that the radiation is, is not only coming out from near the plant, you know, it, 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 and obviously there's an awful lot coming out from near the plant. Um, but now it's also washing down from the mountain. So we're seeing um, radioactive cesium and strontium coming down from the mountain streams and um, collecting in the, in the sediment in the mountain streams when they get to the shallow spots right near where the ocean meets the stream. Um, and, of course, that's where the fish love to eat in that, in that shallow transition between the ocean and the, uh, um, and, the, and the freshwater. So we're seeing behind dams, we're seeing behind rocks, any place where the water gets a chance to settle out, we're seeing very large quantities, especially of cesium. That seems to be what they're most looking for, but, of course, strontium would be there too. We're seeing large quantities of, uh, of cesium in the soil, now, this is uh, uh, fascinating because the, um, the International Council on Radiation Protection assumes that strontium is dissolved. In other words, it's Cesium spread or strontium? That the both, I'm sorry, cesium and strontium yeah. are dissolved. And let's go to cesium first. Uh, that, that the cesium is dissolved in the water uniformly, mm. and it just kind of washes out into the ocean. That's not happening. 90% of the cesium is trapped in this in very small, muddy um, hot particles. And, of course, those hot particles lie in the bottom and get absorbed by the root structure of the seaweed, which gets eaten by little critters and works its way up the food chain. And cesium is a, is a muscle seeker, and strontium is a bone seeker. So we're seeing cesium in the fish meat, and we're seeing strontium in the fish bone. Now, the Japanese actually eat fish with the bone, uh, the bone as well as the meat. And also, of course, if you cook a stew, you're going to also um, cook, the, cook the bone. Um, so uh, there's a danger not just of eating what's in the meat, but also the strontium that's in the bone. Um, and now this is working its way uh, into the ocean, not just at Fukushima, 
but 100 miles north and 100 miles south because it's running out of the mountain ranges nearby. Uh, so we're seeing um, relatively large fish on the order of um, uh, 5 or 6 inches, 20, 20 centimeter, 15 centimeter fish um, already with, with high concentrations of cesium. And, of course, those fish are eaten by bigger fish, and eventually it works its way up to the tuna and the salmon and the mackerel at the top of the food chain. And I think it will be, you know, next year before we start to see the, um, uh, you know, highly contaminated tuna and mackerel and salmon. So I'm eating as much uh, salmon as I can this year because I'm a little bit concerned about what will happen next year. Yeah, but what, what about the fact that the EPA is not testing the fish caught on the West Coast and probably won't? And, you know, what does that mean? Oh, I know. It's a travesty. I, I think, of, you know, we have in our ports in the United States, we have monitors on the ports to look for nuclear weapons coming in and things like that. And it's likely a year from now that a, a, a truckload of tuna will fire off a radiation oh. alarm uh, because it's loaded with cesium. And I think at that point, hopefully, there'll be a, a whistleblower at the docks to uh, alert the authorities. But you're absolutely right, though. The, the government's response, the United States government, the Japanese government, and really governments throughout the world, their response to this incident has been to minimize it because there's just way too much money on the line. It's obscene. Now, you, now, Annie, as a nuclear engineer, it's not just strontium and cesium. Please talk about... You know, there are 200 isotopes, radioactive elements, made in the reactor, some of which last seconds and some last millions of years. So what are the, what, what are the other common elements that are being tipped into the ocean at this point in time? Uh, wow. I, I, Come I, on, uh, Arnie. <laughs> I, I, I don't know how one. Ruthenium, <laughs> ruthenium, americium, neptunium, plutonium, uh, uh, carbon americium. Four, americium, carbon fourteen, tritium. No. Uh, you know, there are so many. Ra uh, yeah. Cobalt sixty, almost certainly. Um, radioactive silver, and you just need to get a periodic table and, and look at all the elements and look at their half lives to see how long they last and. Then you extrapolate and, and radioactive iodine one two nine with a half life of seventeen million years. I mean this sort of thing. All they're measuring at the moment, it seems, is cesium, you know, which talk about is an it, indicator. It is but it, but it's an indicator of so many other things that they're not talking about. Yes, you're right. And there's an, another example: is that strontium is emitted from the nuclear reactors, and after thirty years, it decays. But it's not to a stable element. It decays to yttrium and yttrium decays 12 hours later. So you essentially, when the strontium decays, it's a double hit. You know, you get the strontium decay followed rapidly by the yttrium decay. So there's, a, a, you know, there's a witch's brew of chemicals in the ocean. Witch's brew. You know, there's a, a, another thing. You recall last time we talked, you, you spoke eloquently about the, uh, uh, the, the, the xenon-133 um, isotope in the airborne contamination. And we just got information that during the first week, so this wasn't just a, a passing clown, but during the first week, people in Fukushima Prefecture were exposed to 1,300 becquerels per cubic meter of, of, of 133. And, you know, that's medical level, as, as you were you know, discussing last time, about fat solubility and all that kind of stuff. So it, it concerns me that um, we, um, it, the one, they, they obviously should have evacuated much further, much faster. But there's, there's an exposure that's being underestimated. The Japanese are saying, they, they didn't listen to our show last month, Helen. The, the <laughs> Japanese are saying, well, it's a noble gas, so therefore don't worry about it. But, uh, but as you discussed, you know, it, it's fat soluble, it gets in your lungs and, and in your tissue and, and hangs around for quite a while. Yes, and also if you're immersed in a cloud of, of xenon-133, uh, you're also receiving high-level gamma radiation externally, like high-level X-rays, as well as inhaling the xenon-133 that is absorbed through the lung and, and goes to fatty tissue, exposing gonads, ovaries and testicles and other such organs to um, high-level gamma radiation. But it's not just cesium. 
Arnie, there are three noble gases. One is xenon, yeah. oh, not cesium, I mean xenon 133. There's argon and krypton as well. And they're all yeah. high level gamma emitters as well. So, they're, you know, as is, they only talk about cesium in Japan and maybe strontium. They're, not, they're ignoring easily, you know, up to 100 other in extraordinarily dangerous um, radioactive elements all of which have different life cycles in the biological system and in the human body. Um, you're you're that, absolutely right. And then to add to that list that you just gave iodine, if the, if if there was if there was xenon one thirty if if there was xenon um, one thirty three, there clearly had to be iodine yeah. too, and and that means thyroid exposure. Oh yeah. Now okay, so now we should get on to what what they're finding cesium in. Baby's powdered milk. Um, yeah, that was produced. Um, I don't know, 200 miles or 200 k from the reactor. Talk about that, honey, and that they've had to recall 400,000 cans of powdered infant milk formula. Talk about that. Um, well, you you basically touched on it all. There was a. Um, they just now discovered, and it had to be there earlier, but it just now measured. Uh, somebody finally looked at powdered milk and discovered uh, you know, high levels of cesium in the powdered milk. Uh, there was a recall, although the Japanese government is saying, uh, well, it, you really can live with this level of radioactivity in your body. Um, it, it's interesting because they're making the uh, radioactive banana analogy. And they're saying, well, when you eat a banana... You have potassium-40, and so you're taking in a radioactive isotope, a naturally occurring one. So this is nothing more than eating just a few more bananas. Is that what they're but, saying, is it? Yes, that's what the Japanese government said. Jeez. And, and of course, it's absurd because uh, your body is in um, uh, has a stable relationship with potassium-40. What you take in, you excrete out. And it's just a, a, a normal part of your, your everyday uh, metabolism. Yeah, but it also could be producing its radioactive and it could be producing some of the cancers that we see already because there's no level of radiation that's safe and that's background radiation, which is responsible for a fair numbers of cancers, not just the potassium-40, but the radon and radium and everything we live with every day. And that obviously induces uh, some or quite a few of the cancers that we see and have seen for thousands of years background radiation. Yeah. But if you add to the background radiation by poor having cesium in infant formula, let me just extrapolate a little on this, if I may, Arnie, as a pediatrician. Fetuses are thousands of times more sensitive to radiation than adults. Infants are hundreds of times more so because their cells are rapidly dividing and it's during the process of mitosis and cell division that genes are very vulnerable to being damaged by radiation, hence it can induce cancer. Children are 10 to 20 times more sensitive than adults, and the nuclear industry uses a standard 70 kilogram white young male uh, as a standard for the amount of radiation to which people can be exposed. But the population is heterogeneous. It's, you know, it's got old people who are very sensitive. It's got immunocompromised patients who are very sensitive. It's got fetuses, children, and the like. So let's talk about cesium in infant formula. <laughs> cesium is, you're right, a potassium analog, and it goes to muscle and brain. And it causes a very rare form of muscle sarcoma, rhabdomyosarcoma, which is very malignant and extremely dangerous. It also causes brain tumors. It causes ovarian cancers, uh, testicular cancers, um, and other cancers throughout the body. Now, because these are babies drinking the formula, they're innately sensitive. And from what I've read, the Japanese government says it's nothing to worry about. You know, it's just a little tiny bit. and But... but that is antithetical to anything we know about radiation biology. I can't understand how these people are getting away with, with this 